It is so great spending time with you this morning as we also now in the last moment of our generosity process for 2020. Thank you for joining with us and today it will also be my privilege um, on this uh, public platform uh, to do an ask in terms of your contribution for the generosity fund. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been talking about these three amazing words. We've been talking about faith, love, and hope. And we discovered in these words that it, it's a lot more than just nice biblical words, the words that we put up on the wall in our house, uh, something on a coffee mug. These words are actually heart-shaping words. It's the words that, that God uses literally to address uh, the condition of humanity. When we think about faith, uh, it addresses the, the condition of lostness. When we talk about love, it addresses the pain of humanity. And when we talk about hope, it is the, it is the, the way that God brings hope. Um, uh, something to the brokenness uh, of this world. So these words literally shape our lives. It shapes our hearts. It's like, it's like God's hands on our hearts, molding our hearts in a shape that will glorify Him. So this is the message of the gospel, these three words. It is the example we see in the life of of Jesus. When we think about faith, it is not just the faith that we put in Christ to receive salvation, but the moment that we are saved because of this faith, it is also we becoming agents of faith in this world to share this love of God with other people and lead them to faith. The same goes for hope. It is not just us receiving this hope from God, this understanding that the victory of the cross was enough, that it was successful, and that God will make all things new. That is our hope. But we also receive this hope as something that we can share with this world in the, in the state of brokenness and bring the hope of the reality of the cross and the finished work of Christ. Exactly the same goes for love as love shapes our heart when we receive God's love and how, how God loves us, how we are the the, literally the, the, the point at which God aims His love. Uh, but the moment we receive His love, it is also us that takes this love to a hurting world and to tell them about the love of God. These words literally shape our lives as Jesus followers. Now, the great thing about Scripture is that it explains that the moment these words start shaping your heart, it also leads to action. And that's actually what we're after in this process, because God left us on this planet um, to be in charge of of, the, of the, the, the expression of his kingdom. And these words are literally the fuel that drives us to bring his kingdom uh, to, this, to this world. So there needs to be something of an action that flows out of these words. So when Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13, he says the following. He says, so now faith, hope, and love abide. These three but the greatest of these is love. The message translation says the following. It says in verse 13, But for right now, until that completeness, we have three things to do that leads toward that consummation. Trust steadily in God, hope unswervingly, love extravagantly, and the best of the three is love. Love extravagantly. I love the way that Paul in 1 Corinthians 13 just explains to us that these three words asks for something of an action. It is not just words that shape our hearts in terms of feeling. It is also words that shape our lives in terms of of action. So if we think about our lives and we think about the big components that we actually manage in our lives, it will be our time, our talents, and our treasures. These are three words that also explain something of God's influence in our lives. These are the, are the areas of our lives that God wants to have influence in. 
When we think about time, many times we will, we will consider time and, uh, and life as something that belongs to us. I can do with my time whatever I want to do. But the moment that, the, that these, these gospel words impact my life and these words shape my heart, I suddenly realize that time doesn't belong to me, that life is a gift from God and that I need to utilize my time to serve the purposes of God. So when faith becomes an action word in the context of time, I suddenly discover that I have time available to make friends with unbelievers with whom I can share my faith. I can invite them to Alpha Course. I can invite them to church or to community group. And then I am actually utilizing time to serve the glory of God. When hope becomes an action word, I discover that I have time available to, to go out into the brokenness of this world, whether it be at my workplace, whether it be at the school where my children attend, whether it be in local governance or whatever I see broken in this world. I can go and I can give my time to serve God's kingdom in the brokenness in my world. When love becomes an action word in the context of my time, I discover that God gave me capacity to serve. And I can take some of the time that I have and I can be a servant in church, taking up responsibility in the children's ministry, um, going to our children's home, El Piso, to go serve there and look after babies. I can give my time at pop-up. I can give my time going to the nations, I can give my time wherever God calls me, and I can make love an action word. Secondly, it, is, it has an influence on the way that I see my talents. Many times we consider our talents also be, to be just like time, our own. It is my talent. Uh, I, I can utilize this. I can develop it in a way that I can actually make a living of my talent. And I'm sure that God gave us talents to be responsible and to make a living with whatever God gave us. But that's not the only purpose in giving us talents, giving us gifts. The, the, the reason behind God giving us these talents would also be that these three words, faith, hope, and love, form my heart, mold my heart, so that my talents will be given for the purposes of of God. So many of our people will have a beautiful gift in terms of music or singing. You see, when faith becomes an action word, you spend that gift that God gave you, that talent of making music and joining the worship team and giving your life so that other people may grow in faith. When, 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 when hope becomes an action word in the context uh, of your talents, you realize that I can actually go out and I can go to a school or I can go to an institution that's going through difficult times and I have the talent of admin and organization and I can spend that talent in that environment to bring glory to God. You know, you can say, I don't have any talents. I can't do anything. Then when love becomes an action word for you, you can pick up a shovel and clean the road in front of you because that is how we love the city, by taking responsibility and turning these words into action. Of time, talent, and treasure, treasure is always the most difficult one. Because we love having our own treasure. And that's the word treasure. We want to keep it close to us. But in my own life, I discovered that the treasure I have, whether it's possessions or money, is never mine. I am not the owner. God is the owner. And I am only the steward. I am the manager of what belongs to God. And because it belongs to God, I need to manage it in a way 
that reflects these priorities in God's kingdom. So when, when faith for me became an action word in my treasure, I realized that tithing is important. And I faithfully do that because I understand that through my faithful giving in the church, other people's faith are being built. In the area of hope, when that became an uh, action word, I realized that giving to, for instance, the generosity fund utilizes the money that I have to bring hope to our city, to put hope in schools, to help people that's going through difficult times in our life center. When I discovered that love is an action word, it stirred my heart in terms of the poor. And giving hope, giving money to, for instance, a hope fund that gives food parcels to people, that suddenly utilized, I spend my money on the priorities of God. And then these words become action words. I think that's what Paul meant when he, he, he kind of coined this phrase, to be driven by love. When we read the portion where this famous uh, scripture comes from in 2 Corinthians 5, we see the context of that scripture is actually, I think the, the church in Corinth was kind of accusing Paul of being a bit too intense. It's as if the conversation before the scripture would have been, Paul, Paul, maybe you need to slow down a bit. This thing that you are driving, this gospel, this, this expression of God's love in this world is really getting a bit too intense. You need to slow down. Because when, when the message translation um, translates this, it starts with Paul saying in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 13, he says, if I acted crazy, I did it for God. If I acted over serious, I did it for you. You see, Paul needed to defend the way that he was addressing this thing of love, saying that I am driven by love. And the next moment, this is exactly what Paul does. He says, guys, you say that I am too serious. You say that I'm too intense. But let me tell you, I am driven by the love of God. And this is what he says in verse 14. He says, for the love of Christ compels us since we have been we have reached this conclusion that one died for all and therefore all died and he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves but for the one who died for them and was Raised. What an amazing uh, scripture. What an amazing idea that Paul brings. And he says, guys, don't worry that I'm so intense. I am driven by a reality of the completed work of Christ. How can we say that he died unless we understand that he made it possible for everybody to die and to live a new life? Every person on this planet needs to hear that. God paid a price. Jesus died on the cross to bring newness to this planet, to, to bring recovery to this planet, to bring restoration to this planet. I cannot keep quiet about that. I am driven by this reality. You see, this, this completed work of Christ, when, when Paul reflects on it in 2 Corinthians 5, he writes that, that famous verse as he says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The cross was successful. Jesus made it possible for broken, sinful human beings to be restored to God's original picture for humanity. The second Adam was or the first Adam was replaced by a second Adam, where the first Adam he was a loser. God gave us victory in Christ. Then Paul goes on and he says in verse 18, he says, everything is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ. And then, just as important, given us the ministry of reconciliation. It's not just that faith saves us. We become agents of faith. It's not that we experience the love of God. We become the agents 
of God's love. We don't just receive hope. We become the agents of hope in this world. Verse 19, Paul says, that is in Christ. God was reconciling the world with himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed the message of this reconciliation to us. And then Paul ends with this verse saying, therefore, we are ambassadors of God. What a message. That is the implication of the words that we are talking about. They mold our hearts and then they bring us to action, to actually love our city. In Doxodeo, being driven by love means that we love the city that God put us in. That is our focus. That is our heart. We love this city. But we must ask ourselves, is this love for the city a real love? Is it a godly love? Is this the love that God intended? Or is this love just a love in terms of a benefit that I have in this city? I love the way Tim Keller explains it. He says that in every city you will find four residents, four types of people that live in that city. Each one of them has something of a love for the city or a hate for the city, but they are connected to the city in a very specific way. And then he says, we cannot be one of these four. We need to be the fifth category. We need to create a new category of love for the city if we are Christ followers. So the first category, he says, they are the commuters. So they travel through the city. They come into the city. They receive something. They come here to do something. They come here to work. They come here to do business. They open a practice here. They come here to study. Then they leave again. There's no connection to the city. There's no love for the city. They just commute through the city. The next category is the survivors. And that's the people that live in a city that actually, they don't love the city at all. They hate the city. They don't want to be in the city. They want to live in another place. They don't want to be in the hustle and bustle and busyness of a city. They'd rather live somewhere next to the ocean or, or maybe somewhere in a rural area. They have no love for the city. Then you get the consumers. The consumers, they, they love the city for the experience that the city can give them. You see, cities have beautiful experiences. There's theaters, there's coffee shops, there's parks and places you can go. There's a vibe. There's, there's, there's a lot of life in a city. And the consumers come and they draw life. They draw experience from the city. But they only love the city for the experience that the city can give them. And then the last category says you get the natives. They are the people that just live in the city. They don't love the city. They actually don't even think about the city. They just live in the city. They, they're not worried about the potholes. They're not worried about things not working, uh, things going, going south. It's just, I'm here. This is the place I live. And I have no connection to the city. What Keller then says is that you get the Jesus followers. And they look at the city in a different way way. It's almost as if it is that story that we so many times tell in Doxodeo in Mark chapter 6 when Jesus and his disciples were confronted with a crowd of people that was hungry. And Jesus uh, sitting there looking at his disciples, they coming to him and saying, Jesus, we have a problem. The people are hungry. How are we going to feed them? You see, they, they were just attending the group. They had no responsibility for the group. They had no love for the people. And then Jesus reacted by saying, no, you go and feed them. And suddenly the, the disciples were confronted with their own hearts being disconnected from the crowd of people. Jesus moved his disciples from concern to compassion. You see, when we talk about our relationship to the city, we ought to be lovers of the city. 
We're not, we not commuters. We are not survivors. We are not consumers. We are not just natives. We are lovers of the city. And to be a lover of the city, you need to have something of an image. What does that look like? And I think being a lover of a city means that you love this city in the same way as a husband would love his wife, but maybe after being married for 20 or 30 years. So the young, young guys, you won't understand this, so let me explain to you. When you fall in love and you consider getting married, many times it is because you only discovered something on the outside of the person that you're going to marry. You discovered the six packs. You discovered all the beautiful aspects of this person's body. And you, you fall in love with the exterior. But any person married for 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 years will tell you that these exterior elements at some stage disappear. And the, 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 the recipe for a successful marriage is finding the person on the inside. And, and the, the way that you build a successful marriage after decades of loving one another is, is built on two things. The first, that you will always in priority put your spouse first. And secondly, that you will serve with all of your heart. You will serve your spouse. Exactly the same in terms of love for the city. The city is more than architecture. It is more than roads. It is more than infrastructure. This city is made up of people. And unless we focus our love on the people of the city, we might be living in a city and not loving the city. Being a lover of the city would mean that we will give this city higher priority. Being a lover of the city will mean that we, we will find opportunities to serve the city like a husband, a godly husband, will serve his wife. That is what we see as Dr. Deo when we say we are driven by love and we love this city. It means that this city becomes important to us and the people of the city becomes our focus as we bring these three words in action to them, telling them about the, the faith in Christ that brings salvation, bringing to them the love of God that heals the pain and bringing to them the hope of Christ's victory on the cross in which God promises that He will make everything new. What is the condition of your heart towards the city? Where are you? What kind of resident are you in the city? Because God wants to capture our hearts with a love for the people of the city so that we will be known as the lovers of Bloemfontein. Let's pray together. Father, we come and we, we ask you that today, like Paul is writing, that you will capture our hearts and that we will be driven by love. We need, Lord, that you will mold our hearts Many times our hearts are so molded by the priorities of this world, molded by the priorities of our own comfort and our own selfishness. Lord, will you mold our hearts to be lovers of the city? And as we go into action, showing faith, showing love, bringing hope to the city, Lord, we trust you that you will build a city that will glorify you. Thank you that nothing that is lost, nothing that is broken, and nothing that is carrying pain is beyond your reach if only we would be willing to turn these words into action. Grab our hearts. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we spoke about three, these three amazing words, hope, faith, and love. And today we, we stopped at, at this reality that God calls us into to be lovers of the city, to be driven by love. 
In Doxodeo Bloemfontein, we want to make sure that these words are not just nice words, but we are trusting God that these words will go over into action as we take responsibility for our city. Many years ago, we established a fund called the Generosity Fund, spelled wrongly with the C, to just express something of our heart for the city. This fund literally yearly uh, puts us in a place where we have resources available to run projects in this city in the next year. So what I'm doing today is I'm going to ask you whether you would consider contributing to this fund. We know the reality of the current economic situation but we also know the reality of the need of the city. For 2021, we are trusting God for 1.3 million rand. And that sounds like a large amount of money. But if only 310 people are willing to give 350 rand a month for 12 months, we will have enough money to be generous to this city in the coming year. There's a possibility that you can, uh, can contact us and, or go to our website. They will find a debit order that you can download and fill in. Uh, we prefer the debit order because that empowers us to have a consistent inflow of money so that we can also pay salaries for our youth workers. If you're willing to give one single amount, that is also amazing and we encourage you to do that. But you will also receive an SMS of an electronic debit order that you can fill in. And we want to ask you whether you would consider that. Maybe 350 Rand is too much. Maybe 150 Rand will be a sacrifice that you can make. Or maybe a larger, a larger amount, maybe 2,000 Rand or 5,000 Rand. That is a sacrifice that you are willing to make. If you go to that link and you click on the debit order, it will be important just to fill in the, the debit order in a correct, correct way. This debit order will only run from December till November next year. So if you have a current debit order already in the generosity fund, that will still run till November of 2020. And then you need to complete a new debit order for the coming year. When you open the electronic version, uh, please make sure that you pick the right purpose for the debit order, that would be the generosity fund. You'll see there's a small list. The campus would be Bloemfontein. You fill in your personal details. Please make sure that when you do the starting date, that that date should be the 1st of December or at least the first week of December of 2020. And that de debit order ought to run till the 30th of November of 2021. You can also choose the option not to stop the debit order unless you want to stop it manually. The last thing that you fill in is just the amount and then the authorization. Thank you that we can ask you to generously contribute to our generosity fund as we look forward in 2021 to be driven by the love of God and pursue every opportunity that we can love and serve our city. I thank you. <laughs>